Today, we're uh, taking a shortcut to getting you up to speed on something really crucial in software, how different applications actually talk to each other. We're diving into API communication protocols. And we've got some great material here, a really comprehensive guide that looks at, what, six key protocols? Yeah, the ones that really form the backbone for networked apps, everything from big web services to tiny little IoT devices. Our mission really is to pull out the key info for you help you understand the differences, the strengths, and importantly, the risks of each one. It's more than just definitions, right? It's understanding why picking the right protocol is so critical for performance, scaling, security, even just making development easier. Okay, let's get into it. Let's kick things off with probably the most familiar one for most people, REST. REST, Representational State Transfer. It's uh, architectural style, not strictly a protocol like some others, built on that stateless client server model. Uses standard HTTP methods. What's the real, like, the core idea behind why it got so popular? Well, I think the genius of REST really is its simplicity, its elegance. It cleverly used what was already there, you know, HTTP, the protocol that runs the web. That made integrating APIs way more straightforward than maybe older methods. And that stateless part is key. Each request has everything the server needs. Server doesn't need to remember anything about you from the last request. Data gets treated as resources identified by your eyes. Simple concept. It's like a web address for data. Exactly. And it uses those HTTP verbs everyone kind of knows. Get to read. Post to create. Put to update or create. Delete. Sometimes patch for smaller updates. Precisely. And the data format is usually JSON these days. Very lightweight, human readable. So when should you, as a developer, really be thinking, OK, REST is the answer here. What's its sweet spot? It really shines for those standard CRO operations. Mm -hmm. Create, read, update, delete, especially for web apps, mobile apps, um, public-facing APIs, basically anywhere simplicity, scalability, and just broad compatibility are key. If you need something easy to understand and widely supported, REST is often the first choice. But nothing's perfect. Yeah. What are the common headaches people run into with REST? Yeah, that brings up a really important point. Because you have these fixed endpoints for resources, you can run into overfetching. You ask for a user, maybe you get their entire profile, address, order history, when all you needed was their name. <laughs> Wasted data. Right. Or the opposite, underfetching. Yeah. You need the user and their last five orders, but that requires, say, one call for the user, then another five calls for each order. Multiple round trips slows things down. Exactly. Both scenarios hit your network latency, load times. It's especially noticeable on mobile or complex interfaces. Okay, so from the familiar rest, let's pivot. Let's talk about something known for pure speed, gRPC. Google Remote Procedure Call, open source from Google, built for efficiency. What's under the hood that makes it so fast? The absolute core difference is how it handles data. Yeah. gRPC uses protocol buffers. That's Google's own method for serializing structured data. It's language neutral, platform neutral. And it's binary, right? Not text like JSON. Yeah. Yeah. Agri. Binary. Which means the data packets are much, much smaller and faster to parse than text-based JSON or XML. Big difference in high volume traffic. Plus, it enforces strongly typed contracts. You define your service and messages in these .proto files. Ah, so client and server have to agree on the data structure beforehand. Right. Strict consistency. It catches errors early. And it supports different communication patterns, like bidirectional streaming. Great for real-time stuff. And it's language agnostic, too. You write one .proto file, and it can generate the client and server code in Java, Python, Go, C++, A, whatever you need. You mentioned HTTP2 earlier as well. That's not just about speed. It changes how connections work, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. HTTP2 is fundamental to gRPC's performance. It allows multiplexing, sending multiple requests and responses over a single TCP connection at the same time. No more waiting for one request to finish before starting the next on that connection. Gets rid of that head of line blocking. Exactly. And header compression shrinks the request headers way down. Again, less data over the wire, especially for lots of small requests. It's a huge efficiency game. So where does gRPC really fit best? What are the ideal use cases? It's fantastic for internal microservices communication. Think backend systems talking to each other inside your own network, especially where you need high traffic, low latency, performance, efficiency, those strict contracts across maybe different teams using different languages. That's where gRPC shines. Okay, but what are the catches, the yeah. trade-offs? Well, the big one is browser support. Natively, browsers don't really speak gRPC. You often need a proxy layer like gRPC web to translate. That adds complexity. Right, another moving part. Yeah, and the setup generally can be a bit more involved than setting up a simple REST API. Plus, the binary payloads, great for machines, 
not so great for humans trying to debug. You need specific tools to see what's actually being sent. Okay, makes sense. Let's shift gears again. GraphQL. This one came out of Facebook, right? <laughs> trying to solve some of those REST issues we talked about, like overfetching. It's a query language for your API. Let's the client ask for exactly what it needs. How does that work in practice? That's the revolutionary part, really. It completely flips the data fetching model. Instead of the server defining rigid endpoints returning fixed data structures like in REST, GraphQL lets the client specify the shape of the data it wants back, all through a single endpoint, usually just GraphQ. So no more getting the whole user object when you just need the email. Precisely. You just yeah. ask for user email. That's it. Solves over fetching. And if you need the user's email and their last three post titles, you ask for user email, post slate, title in one query. Ah, uh, so it's all under fetching too. One request gets related data. Exactly. Huge win for reducing network calls. It also has a strong type system built in the schema. This acts as the contract. And it allows for introspection, meaning tools can query the schema itself to see what queries and types are available. Great for developer tooling. I heard it's also really good at pulling data together from different places, like multiple back-end services. Absolutely. That's a major strength. Your GraphQL server can act as a gateway or facade. A single query from the client might trigger the GraphQL server to fetch data from your user database, your product catalog service, your reviews API, wherever. It then stitches that data together into the exact shape the client requested. Super powerful for microservice architectures. So. Where does GraphQL make the most sense? What projects benefit most? It's really strong for front-end heavy applications. Think complex single-page apps, SPAs. Like React or Vue apps. Exactly. Mobile apps, too. Anywhere the client's data needs are diverse or change frequently. And as we said, as an aggregation layer for microservices, it simplifies the front-end's interaction with a complex backend. Okay, sounds great. But what are the potential downsides? Where can you get tripped up with GraphQL? Well, that flexibility is powerful but it can be dangerous. Clients can potentially craft really complex, deeply nested queries that could hammer your backend servers if you're not careful. Performance bottlenecks are a real concern. So you need good query analysis and possibly limits. Definitely. Rate limiting, query depth limiting, complexity analysis, things like that. Also, caching is different. Standard HTTP caching based on URLs doesn't work as well because you usually only have one URL endpoint. Yeah. You need more sophisticated caching strategies. And security if clients can ask for anything. Big consideration. You need robust authorization logic within your GraphQL resolvers to make sure users only see the data they're allowed to see. It's easy to accidentally expose too much if you're not careful. Yeah. And, you know, it just adds another layer, more complexity in your overall stack compared to a simple REST API. Right. Okay, let's take a step back now, maybe look at something more established. SOAP, Simple Object Access Protocol, often associated with big enterprise systems, XML, What's the story here? Why would you well, choose SOAP today? SOP is really about robustness and standards. Heavy emphasis on formal specifications. Things like WS security for encrypting or signing parts of the message itself. WS reliable messaging to guarantee a message gets delivered even if the network hiccups. Okay, so guarantees. Yes, and WS atomic transaction for coordinating operations across multiple services, ensuring they all succeed or all fail together. Think acided compliance. Ah, like database transactions, but for web services, crucial for things like finance. Exactly. Atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. If you're transferring funds between banks, you need that guarantee. SOP was built with those scenarios in mind. It also has standardized XML-based fault handling, and it uses WSDL web services description language. It's a contract file. Very strict. Very strict. It defines everything. The operations, the data types, the message formats. Contract first design is core to SOP. So who's actually using SOP heavily now? You still see it a lot in enterprise settings. Banking, definitely. Telecommunications, government systems, healthcare sometimes. Any way that needs that heavy duty security, complex transaction support, strict compliance requirements, and maybe needs to integrate older heterogeneous systems, reliability is paramount. Okay, but the trade-off is that complexity and the, the XML verbosity, right? I remember seeing SOP messages. They were huge. Oh, absolutely. That's the main drawback for many. Yeah. XML is inherently verbose compared to JSON. Lots of tags, namespaces. Bigger payloads, more bandwidth. Yep. And the learning curve is steeper. All those WS standards, it's a lot to take in. Implementation and maintenance are generally more complex, and performance is usually slower compared to REST or gRPC. But that weight, that strictness, is kind of the point for its target audience, isn't it? It really is. 
For those mission critical enterprise scenarios, the verbosity and complexity were the price you paid for that ironclad reliability and feature set defined by the standards. It solves a specific set of hard problems. Okay, moving away from the request response world now, let's talk about constant connection. WebSockets. These establish a persistent two way street over a single TCP connection, right? Unlike HTTP's request response close connection model, how does that change things? It fundamentally changes the latency profile after the connection is set up. There is an initial HTTP handshake to upgrade the connection to WebSocket, but once that's done, the channel stays open. Data frames sent back and forth after that are very lightweight, much lower overhead than starting a new HTTP request every time. And it's truly bidirectional. Server can just send data whenever. Exactly. Full duplex. Both client and server can push messages independently at any time. That server push is key for real-time features. The server doesn't have to wait for the client to ask anything new. It can just send updates immediately. So the prime use cases jump right out, don't they? They really do. Think anything needing instant updates, chat applications are the classic example. Online, multiplayer gaming, collaborative editing tools like Google Docs where you see others typing in real time. It's live sports scores, mm -hmm. stock tickers. Financial trading platforms, definitely. Anywhere low latency, continuous updates are essential. What are the things you need to be careful about if you decide to use WebSockets? What are the complexities involved? Well, managing that persistent connection is one thing. You need robust logic to handle disconnects, retries, reconnections gracefully. It's not fire and forget like HTTP. Not at all. And because it's stateful, the connection stays open. Your application logic on both the client and server needs to manage that state. Who's connected? What are they subscribed to? That adds complexity. Security is also different. You need to worry about things like WebSocket hijacking, cross-site WebSocket hijacking, or CSWSH. Right. And scaling can be a challenge. Holding open thousands or millions of persistent connections consumes server resources differently than handling lots of short-lived HTTP requests. You need infrastructure designed for it. Okay. One more to cover. Let's go really lightweight. Yeah. MQTT, Message Queuing Telemetry Transport. Designed for, like, the toughest network conditions. Low bandwidth, high latency, maybe unreliable connections. Perfect for IoT. That's exactly its niche. It was designed from the ground up for constrained environments. Minimalist design is the name of the game. Very small packet overhead, reducing network bandwidth usage, and crucially, power consumption on battery-operated devices. Tiny sensors, wearables... That kind of thing. Precisely. It uses a published subscribe model, which is different from request response or even web sockets directly. Clients connect to a central message broker. Then they can publish messages to specific topics like home living room temperature. Other clients can subscribe to those topics and the broker routes the messages to all subscribers, decouples the publisher and subscriber. Interesting. And it has different levels of guarantee for message delivery? Yes. Three, quality of service levels, QoS. QoS zero is at most once. Fire and forget. Best effort might get lost. Lowest overhead. QoS1 is at least once. Guarantees delivery, but duplicates might happen if acknowledgments get lost. Requires acknowledgments. And QoS2 is exactly once. The highest level guarantees delivery exactly one time using a multi-step handshake. Most reliable, but also highest overhead. So you can choose the trade-off based on how critical the message is. Exactly. Flexibility there. And the protocol itself is incredibly lightweight. The minimal fixed header is just two bytes. That's tiny. Wow. So where are we seeing MQTT used most effectively? Everywhere in IoT, really. Sensor networks reporting data temperature, humidity, motion, embedded systems in smart homes controlling lights or locks, wearables sending health data, remote monitoring of industrial equipment, agricultural sensors. Anywhere you have potentially many devices sending small, frequent bits of data over potentially spotty networks where power and bandwidth are precious. What are the limitations? When is MQTT not the right choice? Well, it's definitely not designed for transferring large files or blobs of data. The focus is small messages. Don't try sending images or video over MQTT efficiently. And it's not for complex queries like you'd do against a database. It's simple topic-based routing. Security-wise, the basic protocol has username password authentication, but robust security usually relies on encrypting the connection itself using TLS SSL. Right, securing the pipe. Yeah, and fundamentally, you need that central MQTT broker. It's a critical piece of infrastructure you have to run and manage or use a cloud service for. Okay, that was quite the tour. We've covered a lot of ground. From REST, the workhorse, to high-speed gRPC, client-focused GraphQL, the enterprise-grade SOAP, real-time web sockets, and tiny MQTT for IoT. It really drives home that there's no single silver bullet, is there? Absolutely not.
What should really stand out to you, the listener, is that each of these protocols is a tool designed for a specific job or set of jobs. They all have strengths, they all have weaknesses, they all have ideal scenarios. Understanding those features, the best use cases, and yeah, the risks involved, that's what lets you make smart choices when you're building connected systems. It really makes you wonder, though, as we connect more and more things, think smart cities, yeah, but also think even smaller, like biomedical implants inside the body, constantly reporting data. How will these protocols need to evolve? Or maybe what completely new ways of communicating will we need to invent for that future? It's a fascinating space to watch. 